You know, there's somebody, I can't think of his name right now, I'm subscribed to him, but he's doing a series of videos throughout this month where he's looking at all the individual uh, Scooby-Doo movies and side projects or side movies, if you will, that have come out uh, throughout the years. And I thought about this as I was watching them, and I, and I figured, you know what, I might as well try to give my, you know, two cents. my two cents to the entire Scooby-Doo situation. You see, you see with Scooby, you know, th there's no doubt what, um, what, uh, uh, what this person said is true. You know, originally, uh, Scooby's first movie, if you will, if you want to call it a movie, uh, was 1979's Scooby-Doo Goes Hollywood. Now, although this was a good, uh, this was good in its own right, it had its own, it had its own flavor and all that. You know, it had its own flavor, it had its own theme and everything. I thought it was okay, I just didn't think it was as good as people would like to make it out to be. I mean, yeah, it was a bit of a musical and all that, and yeah, it highlighted Scooby's, you know, career, you know, Scooby's adventures at that time from, you know, Where Are You to the movies to Scooby-Doo show. I, I made it highlighted all that. And, but, and, and to me, I, the reason this was made, if you, if you really want to think about it, it was the first primetime special for Scooby. And considered basically as a hour long movie when you add in commercials and all that, or basically a forty five minute movie. But basically Scooby Doo Goes Hollywood when you think about it was actually made when you think about this as a tenth anniversary special. Cause it was made in the year I was born, nineteen seventy nine. And Scooby Doo debuted in 1969 so basically goes hollywood was made for uh the 10-year anniversary and again i'm not trying to say it wasn't good or anything it's just it's kind of hard to to s look at something like that and say you know you know what what person came up with this idea what person came up with the idea of oh let's do a let's break let's do a Hour long special, 44, 45 minute to hour long special of breaking the fourth wall and making everything that Scooby do, all the adventures that Scooby and the gang were on, nothing but a show, nothing but a behind the scenes kind of thing that, hey, that's nothing more than a show and all that, that mainly they're just actors being themselves, but you, you get the idea. You get the idea. And again, I don't know who came up with it, but again, you know, I understand the, the reason they did it. It, and the reason they did it, as I said, was mainly because, in my opinion, it was for the 10th anniversary of Scooby-Doo. Now, here's the thing about Scooby. It wasn't the, it, this would not be the first time he'd do 45-minute to hour-long movies. No. He actually did 45-minute to hour-long movies in the hour-long Saturday morning cartoon new Scooby-Doo movies. And the new Scooby-Doo movies basically introduced, actually introduced, um, you know, well, it didn't introduce, but kind of, well, but yeah, it kind of introduced the fact that you didn't know who was going to show up. You didn't know what to expect or who to expect. And the one thing about the new Scooby-Doo movies that, you know, make a long story short that they did that basically has been followed upon by a lot of other shows and, and, and movies and stuff is they did crossovers with fellow Hanna Barbera cartoons. Like they did crossovers with Josie, Speed Buggy, Genie, you name it. But anyway, besides that, I I don't think I would consider um, I, I, I don't, <coughs> excuse me, I, I don't think I would consider, 
um, Where Are You? I mean, not Where Are You? Uh, Scooby Doo Goes Hollywood as a movie. I would consider it more as a 10 year anniversary, 45 minute to hour long special. That That's the way I would consider it. Now, I know. Now, I know. Um. That was my dog. Sorry about that. But like, <clears throat> but like I said, you know, I, I know. Like I said, why they did it was t- it's the tenth anniversary. It was the tenth anniversary at the time. That's why they did it. They didn't do it for any other we- reason. Reason except for that. And again, I I don't really consider it a movie, but I understand why people do because. You know, sometimes movies do last an hour, and that's about it. Um, but the movies, for me, when it comes to Scooby-Doo, really started out in the Superstar 10 series. And what's funny about the Scooby-Doo movies, this, you know, depending on how you look at it, depending on how you look at it, um, some people, <laughs> believe it or not, um, some people, believe it or not, and, and I've mentioned this before, would look at the timeline, would actually create a timeline between the films, the films and, let's say, 13 Ghosts. Yeah, they would create a timeline between them. Uh, I'm not lying, folks. They would create a timeline kind of stating that, oh, well, this movie, these movies came out bef- after 13 Ghosts, but guess what? They came out... But, you know, basically they would come up with the idea like, okay, this movie came out before 13 Ghosts, but the way I look at it is it came out, is that the storyline has to take place probably before 13 Ghosts. That, that's how they look at it. <coughs> that's how they look at it because um, I think it was Ghoul School or something like that where they had the mystery van from 13 Ghosts. Go figure. But... Despite whether or not you want to add a timeline or anything, then you try to make it as complex as, you know, some people want to make it out to be, Superstar 10 was just basically standalone cartoons or standalone movies. That's what Hanna Barbera's Superstar 10 was just standalone, fe- direct to video or direct to television, uh, standalone animated films. In other words, had no connection whatsoever to each other. It was completely different. You know, it was completely different. And it was a different adventure every time. It had no connection, like I said, to the previous movie. Like, let's say, Ghoul School. You had Dracula in there, right? As the son of... uh, I mean, as as the father, I should say. As of... Isabella, I think it was her name, Isabella. And yet, in the following movie that followed, you have a different Dracula who wants Shaggy to be his werewolf for the Monster Rally race. So you can you can kind of see that the, that there was no real continuity, no continuation after another, because basically they were just their own individual movies. And like I said, if you want to create a timeline, you want to pick out a certain movie out of the, Scooby, out of the three Scooby-Doo ones to say, oh, well, this took place afterwards or this took place before, you know, then that's fine. That's, that's your opinion. That's your right to do that. But, you know, to me, I, I really, I really, you know, I really don't think there was any connection whatsoever. It's just their own individual uh, continuity. Although I wouldn't have mind, be honest with you, I wouldn't have mind maybe a Scooby-Doo 13 Ghost movie to wrap things up during the Superstar 10 series. But, hey, that's just me. But anyway, um, after that, we did get into several other things. You know, we did get into uh, Scooby-Doo Arabian Nights. And uh, this, to me... Well, this to me was just basically a compilation, basically Hannibal Barbera's version of 
Bugs Bunny's A Thousand and One Tales. That that oh, A Thousand and One Rabbit Tales. So that that's mainly what it was. That's that's mainly what it was. And it it, it to me it's just one of those uh movies that, you know, was direct to video but also the kind that you could watch and it's okay but you know, it's not you know, it's not the best it's not the best that it could be. I mean, you you want to take a look at the stories within it. I think the stories, like say the Aladdin one, where they kind of switched things up a little bit, and they made the princess, the the female basically, they put the female in the Aladdin ver, in the Aladdin position, and they put the uh, the male in the royal ver, in the royal, you know, kind of basically switch things up, which is not the first time Arabian Nights has done this, but. To me, I think it would have been better that instead of having Yogi and Boo Boo as the genies, I think it would have been better if you would have had just maybe a regular genie, you know, just bring a creative genie or something like that, and then have Cindy, Yogi, and Boo Boo in the positions of the um, of the characters. Like, if you want to put the female lead in the Aladdin spot, Cindy would have been great for that. Yogi would have been great in the royal spot. You kind of get the idea. I think that would have helped out. But anyway. Anyway, Arabian Nights is just basically, like I say, Hanna Barbera's take on 1001 Rabbit Tales. Now, again, going back to the Superstar 10 movies, I thought they were good. I thought they were all right. I mean, Ghoul School and Reluctant Werewolf, to me, really stick out as two of the best out of, of the, as the two best ones out of the three uh, that they had. And I, I think there was a reason why they were present, why certain ones out of those three were presented the way they were. Uh, Reluctant Werewolf, to me, I think was presented um, originally as to be the pilot, maybe, to a new series. That's just what I'm thinking, because why would you add in a character like Googie, who apparently basically was the, I, I guess you could say a bit of the Daphne, of the, if you will, of, of, of the movie, why would you put her in if you didn't probably have ideas of maybe doing a show? The same could be said for the not so popular and not so well, in my opinion, not so well done Boo Brothers. Basically to me, even though the Boo Brothers didn't appear as much as this individual said, um, to me it was mainly a pilot in a sense for maybe a Boo, Boo, Boo Brothers show. That's the way I look at it. And You know, I could be wrong, but I think that's what they were heading for. But after those films, after those three Superstar 10 films came and went, as well as Arabian Nights did, then we got into something that a lot of fans had been waiting for. And this had been hyped up for months. You go online, people were talking about it. You know, it had been hyped up for months. In fact, I ended up buying it the first week it was out because it was hyped up that much. And I'm talking about Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. The reason it was hyped up so much is because it was reuniting all the characters in an all-new adventure, basically where the supernatural was real, basically. And it was darker, more grittier. In fact, according to Wikipedia, it almost came close. It almost felt like it could have had a PG-13 feeling to it. That's how dark and gritty it was. But, yeah, it was, I thought it was good. I really enjoyed it. In fact, I bought the VHS, still have the VHS. I transferred the VHS to DVD, and I'm going to probably transfer the variety DVD that I have with it on individually onto its own disc. And, you know, and, and the success of this just kept going on and on. I mean, the next movie you had after that was Witch's Ghost, which was, it was dark and gritty, but not as dark as Zombie Island. Then you had, I think, Alien Invaders, which was dark, but was a lot more lighter in tone than the other two. Then you had Cyber Chase, which, again, lighter in tone, own, if you will. A little dark, but still lighter in tone. And then you got into, basically, um, a revamping of, the, of these movies, which would come out once or twice a year. Of these yearly movies, which would come out once or twice a year where you had the characters back in the old 
original Mystery Inc. designs. And the, the cool thing about this is for some of the movies, you had the original cast together. You had one of the original cast together for the films. That was really, really cool. Uh, in a sense, you had Heather North back as, as Daphne. You you had Nic Nicole Jaffe, I think, back as Velma. And, and, and Casey Kasem as Shaggy and Fred, Fred Welker as Sco uh, Scooby and, and, and Fred. And again, that was all great. That was all cool. It was really, really unique to, to have that all together. But of course, you know, it didn't last. You know, Heather and Nicole basically left. And you had... Uh, Gray Delisi and Mindy Cohn come in and do come in and basically take over as Daphne and <coughs> Daphne and Velma uh, throughout the films. And I'm I gotta say they're actually good representations of who they are. But like I said, after I think it was Alien Invaders of Cyber Chase, you had Legend of the Vampire, which again brought the characters back to the original um, designs and made it more lighter in tone. Then you had Monster of Mexico, and the list just goes on and on. And, you know, you know, sometimes, and, and they went back to the original formula of it being a man in a mask, and sometimes they'd go back to the formula of it being actually a real supernatural situation. And to me, that's what made these, that's what makes these Scooby-Doo movies very popular and very successful, because you you're basically taking them on adventures and expanding on adventures that normally you would have to sque back in the back in the back when they first started you would have to squeeze into just a half hour if not an hour and it wouldn't work the expansion of these movies in the way they are it you know these things work they work without a shadow of a doubt they really do and it really takes chances, you know, it really takes chances, it does things that, you know, really, and it really takes chances, I mean, like, last year, for the first time, I think, since Go, since Scooby-Doo Goes Hollywood, Music of the Vampire was a musical, it was the first musical since 79, you know, and another thing about it, and a lot of people point this out, is there are certain times in the movies where they basically poke fun at themselves and at pop culture. So, to me, the Scooby-Doo movies that have been co been going on for the, you know, it's been going straight forward since '98, have really been worth watching, renting, and getting if you can, because, you know, it basically takes the characters to another level. Now, I will admit that the recent adventures, the recent movies, have taken a bit of the style of of uh, Mystery Incorporated and stuff like that. So you can kind of have, not a connection, but somewhat of a similarity so that when you would watch Mystery Inc., you go like, oh, it's the same animation. But, again, just a terrific... But, again, these movies are just terrific, and you got to check them out. Now, some are not as good as others. I will admit that. But there are a majority of the time they are really, really good. So you have to watch them and you have to check them out when you can. Mask of the Blue Falcon is good. Uh, I haven't checked out. I think I've seen a little bit of Music of Vampire. I think it's good. So you got to check these all out. They're really, really good. And if you're a Shaggy Daphne supporter, there are hints there that you could find if you want to. But... Overall, these movies are definitely worth watching, and I highly recommend watching this guy's series uh, throughout the rest of this month of May, not April, but May. And um, if I said April earlier, I apologize. But, and uh, really, you know, look into it and watch his series, see what he has to say, and then give your own thoughts on it. You know, me personally, like I said, I think, you know, I think, you know, the Scooby-Doo movies are good, you know. I'm not going to deny it. So that's all I have to say about it. And I'll talk to you guys later. Comment below and let me know what you guys think.